This is a short video about medieval armour in Ireland. It is a story that will be told by the real men that wore it, these knights in stone. In Ireland at the time of the Anglo-Norman invasions, armour was not commonly worn among the native Irish and Viking settlers. It was not until the Norman invasions of 1169 that steel armour was worn on a greater scale and the Anglo-Normans also brought a trend of creating stone effigies that centuries later give us great detail of the armour they wore. So watching a medieval movie like Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings can be a little confusing because you see all different types of armour being worn. What you're really looking at is at a film costume designer picking and choosing a look for the film. But in reality, armour, like most military equipment, evolved over time. And most of the examples you will see come from the southeast of Ireland. This area was where the invasion had begun and had become a stronghold for the Anglo-Normans. Now this is not a deep dive into armour and so for simplicity, there were really three phases of armour in Ireland. First was chainmail, second was a mixture of chainmail and plate armour and third was full plate armour which was really a system of articulated armour that offered the knight maximum protection. At the Battle of Hastings in 1066 most of the knights were chainmail down to their knees but this effigy dating from around 1200 in St Mullins Church in Timberlin, County Kildare shows a knight wearing chainmail from head to toe. Under his large shield his chainmail is covered by a surcoat. Surcoats were made of cloth and are thought to have been adopted after the crusade to prevent armour overheating in the hot sun. His head is also protected by a male hood or coif and its bulbous shape may suggest a metal skullcap beneath it. So I'm here in Gerpoint Abbey and this is a fine example of an effigy of two Norman knights. Correction, this is more a stone incision than an effigy. Dating from approximately 1250, it depicts two knights known as the Brethren who, legend tells, were brothers both killed in battle. The pillows behind their heads suggest that they may be lying down or recumbent. The knight on the right is very similar to the Timolin knight as he wears full chainmail. However, the other knight's face is covered by a helmet, called a great helm, showing the move towards the head being fully enclosed and protected. The spurs of a horseman are also present. In the high ceremony of becoming a knight, the attachment of spurs to the knight was one of the final parts of the ritual. At the Battle of Crecy in 1346, King Edward III of England said of his son the Black Prince, Also say to them that they suffer him this day to win his spurs, for if God be pleased, I will this journey be his and honour thereof. Helmets evolved and began to have movable visors that could be closed for combat. Indeed a concept of saluting in the military is thought to have come from knights raising their visors to identify themselves to foes. The main failing of chainmail was that it was not particularly effective against stabbing thrusts and throughout the 1300s individual plates of armour began to be strapped to chainmail. Initially this began on the legs and knees to add protection to mounted knights from foot soldiers but soon more plates were added to the chest and shoulder areas. This is Richard II in 1394 on campaign in Ireland. Here he is knighting one of his men. They all wear a style of helmet called a hound skull with movable visor. The chainmail protects the neck while plates of armour can be seen to protect the legs. However, it is thought at this time that the Scottish Bruce invasions and the Black Death slowed the production of stone effigies and there are a few examples of this hybrid of armour. This example from the 1500s shows a mixture of chainmail and plate. The plates in this case are called lame, which allow for some movement or articulation. So articulate would mean the plates could slide over one another to a certain degree. Chainmail is still a key component and is still present under the lame of the chest and back. Also note the knight's right leg, rubbed bright by the hands of visitors over the centuries. And here, this V-shaped mail seems to have been particularly popular in Ireland as it is represented as a style of armour worn by the famous native Irish gallow glass mercenaries, as shown by these gallow glass tomb weepers of the Irish king Phelim O'Connor. An interesting detail of this knight is how the sword is slung over the shoulder and not tied around the waist in the traditional manner. This shoulder style appears in other effigies in the cathedral. Full plate armour was the zenith of the armoured knight. Now full metal plates of armour were added to the knight to offer maximum protection. What had begun as a collection of separate plates had become a system of articulated steel. So weapons changed to meet 
the strength of the plate armour. Weapons such as the two-handed sword and the two-handed axe were designed to cleave through plate and percussive weapons like the war hammer and the mace were designed to punch holes through the armour. This example from Jerpoint Abbey in County Kilkenny shows a butler knight. Note the small shield. The large shield shown before is no longer needed as this knight is fully armoured and doesn't need excessive protection from a large shield. Also note the dagger being worn on his hip. This was to be used against any possible chinks in his opponent's armour during close combat. His helmet is an open barbed style with T-shaped opening although this knight still wears chainmail about his neck. However, this effigy shows a complete suit of armour. The neck is protected with a plate called a gorget. His chest protected by a full breastplate or cuirass. Gauntlets were made of several thin segments of steel, allowing the hand to move freely. His feet are also protected in a similar manner. By the way, most knights' feet rest on either a dog or a lion. One tradition states the dog shows that they died at home, while the lion, that they died in battle. A few art critics out there, many of these lions look a bit strange to us. But remember, many of these craftsmen may have never seen a lion or even a picture of a lion before. Suits of armour were made by master craftsmen with immense skill and beauty. The best were made in northern Italy and southern Germany. It took quite a time to get suited up in armour. In Shakespeare's Henry V, the night before the famous Battle of Agincourt, we hear, quote, And from the tents, the armourers accomplishing the knights, with busy hammers closing rivets up, give dreadful note of preparation. The average weight of a suit of armour with a chainmail shirt was put at about just over 5 stone or 75 pounds. It is a common misconception that an unhorsed knight could not remount due to the weight of armour. But remember, most knights were young, fit men, used to wearing armour. And even Shakespeare's Henry V tells us, quote, If I could win a lady at Leapfrog, or by vaulting into my saddle with my armour on my back, under the correction of bragging it be spoken, I should quickly leap into a wife. The end of armour came about through many factors. The simple explanation that gunpowder was the reason is just not true. The common foot soldier began to use better weapons and tactics. For example, in the battles of Crecy, Poitiers and Agincourt, English archers played a decisive role, and the battles of Mortgargen and Sempach were won by Swiss soldiers using 21-foot pikes to defeat armoured cavalry.